we are back on this zero hour. I am Richard R.J. Esco, and I've been reading our next guest's work for some time. John Kay is one of Britain's leading economists. He tends to focus on the relationship between economics and business activity. He is, among other things, a regular columnist for the Financial Times, and he is the author of a new book, which in this country, in the United States, is entitled Other People's Money, the Real Business of Finance. John, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Now, listen, uh, first of all, uh, I guess I would start by asking you to summarize. I could try, but uh, I would rather you do it. Uh, just briefly, the premise of other people's money. The basic premise is that over the last 30, 40 years, we've had a massive increase in the role of uh, transactions in financial markets relative to relationships. And my view is that that has generated enormous activity in which people in financial markets basically spend their days dealing with each other. And that's actually, I believe, created a very large financial sector that is less focused on delivering the services that the real economy, those of us who are not in the financial sector, want, and much more on meeting the needs of financial market participants themselves. And that's the story by which a lot of people in finance have got very rich, but businesses and households have not in the main been served better by all that rather profitable for the people engaged in it activity. So you use the phrase the real economy, which we have been known to use on this program as well. So if, if we if we could, then we could distinguish perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, the real economy being that which manifests in the physical world, that, that uh, it creates jobs, a, a service gets provided, goods get produced. In some way, there is a kind of tangible result for human beings. But the other economy, whether, uh, whether it's called the financial sector or it's called the process of financialization, the other, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'll ask you to describe it, but in a sense, that is basically money dealing with money about money and this churn creating enormous profit but not helping this physical world out there. That's the way I picture it. Is that a fair description? Yes, uh, th that's right. I mean, now let's not get hung up on tangible things. What you're doing on this program or what Google are doing or what Facebook are doing, all these things are real goods and services just as much as manufacturers of cars or airplanes or whatever. All that, for me, is the real economy. And, of course, the needs of households are the needs of the real economy. But households need uh, financial services to, to, to pay their bills, to uh, man help them manage the risks of everyday life. They need financial services to help them manage their wealth o over their lifetime. All these things are the things that the financial sector should be doing in order to meet the needs of real businesses and real people. But to a very large extent, what has happened is we have a large activity of people churning paper, as you describe it, trading with each other. And John Kay, economist and author of Other People's Money, I'm going to ask you a question that may be slightly unexpected, but but uh, I think you'll get the point quickly enough. Have you ever seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Yes, I have. So in that movie, whatever you think of it as a, as, as a work of cinematic art, in that movie, Jimmy Stewart plays a banker who contemplates suicide, jumping off a bridge, and until he's shown all the lives that he's touched and helped by his generosity, his human touch in banking, the homes and he's given people, the businesses he's provided, um... One might say that today, many of today's bankers wouldn't be given such a vision, that there would be very little in the way of, uh, of human, ex human community life that has been touched by their work. Is that part of what we're That's talking about? Right. We, we want bankers who are more like Jimmy Stewart. And when Frank Capra made that movie, you'll remember the villain in the movie is Mr. Potter, right. the money-grubbing uh, banker. And there's a great moment in the movie in which uh, George Bailey has shown what the world would have been like without him. And it's called Pottersville. Right. And the housing estate he wanted hasn't been built. And it's tawdry and it's commercial and it's money grubbing and money seeking. And I don't think Capra could ever have imagined that Pottersville would actually come into being. 
but to some degree in the world we're living in at the moment, it has. Well, you know, and it's one thing when rabble-rousers like me say that, John Kay, author of Other, Other People's Money, but when you, with your your uh, extensive background in economics and uh, and distinguished career in it, say that, it, it, it's genuinely troubling. Now, we see in here in the United States, for example, the fin- process of what they call financialization, the sort of absorption of more and more of the economy by the fin- banking sector, financial sector, uh, you know, you hear statistics that perhaps is, uh, half of corporate profits are now being taken up by uh, by this financial uh, financialization process. You hear, you know, I, I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but upwards of perhaps forty percent of of of, uh, of transactions fall under this category. Um, isn't it uh, isn't it something to be con- deeply concerned about? It is. But I think we you should be careful about some of the figures you've just been talking about. Sure. And of course, one of the things I do in the book is I look uh, over quite a lot of these figures quite carefully. Part of the reason uh, I ask the question, and it's a pretty basic question, if people are spending all day exchanging bits of paper with each other, if you lock a group of people in a room and they spend the evening passing bits of paper around the room, then the amount they ought to leave the room with at the end of the evening is pretty much the same amount as the amount with which they've begun. They may have redistributed it, uh, but they haven't actually added anything to it. So I ask the question, where does the profitability of the financial sector come from? And now some of it comes from uh, delivering real goods and services of the kind we've been, we've been talking about. And the truth is most of the people who work in finance are people who are doing pretty ordinary clerical jobs in banking and insurance and aren't paid astronomical sums. But the activities of the people who are paid astronomical sums ask the question, where does the profitability of this activity come from? And I argue that a large part of it comes from from two sources. One is what I call an appropriation of wealth that's been created elsewhere in the economy. But the other, which is an even more striking point, is to say that a fair part of it is actually imaginary. Mm -hmm. And if you want to describe what happened in the run-up to the credit crunch and the crisis of 2008, the story, I think, is that from 2003 to 2007, banks announced they'd made very large profits, uh, paid out a large fraction of them to their senior employees, and then 2008 announced it had all been a terrible mistake. And what happened was their shareholders were more or less wiped out. And, of course, the taxpayer chipped in to, to, to keep the financial sector afloat. They'd, the, they'd imagined uh, profits. I remember writing, I think, rather presciently in, in 2003 that history would tell whether Alan Greenspan was made the, the man who'd made millions of Americans rich or was the man who couldn't bear to tell them they'd only imagined it. Well, sat, uh, sat, gave the answer in 2008. We certainly did. And, 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 and the, there's so many things I'd love to ask you, John Kay, uh, author of Other People's Money. But one of the questions is this. Uh, did we, in fact, learn the lessons we should have learned in 2008? Did we, you know, it seemed to me that we were at a turning point at, at that moment and we could have applied those lessons to change the way we view uh, the financial sector. Did we do that or did we let the moment pass? We let the moment pass. You may remember Rahm Emanuel famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Oh, yes. That is exactly what did did in fact happen. Now, I talk about what should have been done and what should be done in the next crisis, because assuredly we will have the next crisis. And I argue that a lot of people say we need more regulation of the financial sector. I think we already have far too much regulation and regulation has been part of the problem rather than the solution. The trouble is we focused on the wrong kind of regulation. What we've tried to do is to lay down very complicated, elaborate rule books about how people ought to behave. Now, that is a, is a structure that, that doesn't work because all that happens is people don't want to observe the spirit as distinct from the letter of the rules and they find more and more elaborate ways of getting around it. And that's a large part of the explanation of how our financial system has become so complicated. 
Now, let me so ask I'm, you, uh, uh, I'm right, sorry right. to interrupt, but uh, let me ask you a real world, uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, example of that so that I can understand what you mean by too much regulation. Uh, I, have a fr- I, I have a friend who works for J.P. Morgan Chase. I have a very broad circle of friends. And um, he was complaining about Dodd-Frank when it was passed, and he was saying the regulations are too complex. And I said, I'm very sympathetic. Why don't we just break your bank up, and then we don't have to regulate you that way. Um, is that the kind of, is that what you mean by that? Exactly the right answer. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, right. And what we, should, right, what we should do is two or three things. One is we need to break up large financial conglomerates like J.P. Morgan. You'll remember that in in your country, you used to have Glass-Steagall, which separated investment banking from commercial banking. I would like to restore that. Uh, We're actually moving towards creating that in Britain. Uh, we, we, We used to have it. We didn't have legislation that imposed it, but it used to be there. So breaking up financial conglomerates, not just actually splitting off investment and commercial banking and retail banking. But if you ask what investment banking is, what these people in investment banks do is they give advice to companies, they issue securities, they make markets in securities, they trade in the securities themselves, and they offer to manage your money and mine. And if you just think about all these activities, all of them conflict with with every other. And part of the reason the financial sector is profitable is these large conglomerate institutions are exploiting these conflicts of interest and the informational advantages they give them for their own benefit. Uh, you know, it, you're ab- it's, it's so clear to describe it that way. And we're talking with John Kay, author of Other People's Money, The Real Business of Finance. You know, back in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I was a you know mid-level uh, financial analyst f- in risk management, actually. Uh, well, I might as well say it for AIG. And um, in those days, I remember the moment when new guys started coming in and they had impeccable hair and impeccable suits and impeccable teeth, and they always had an army of people with them with enormous three-wing three ring binders filled with equations and i thought about this in reading your book that you know really the 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 underlying theme of unspoken theme of their presentations was always we are much 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 smarter than you will ever be and therefore you should allow us to do exactly what you just described which is to integrate all these functions with their inherent uh, conflicts of interest because you see it's all here in the formula that that it will work out and uh, i was always Say, thinking to myself, I, I guess I'm not as smart as I thought because I don't see it in there anywhere. Uh, were they hoodwinking us? They were largely. And these models aren't useless. In fact, I've spent part of my life building some of these kind of models. Uh, but actually, to take them too seriously is a terrible mistake. You can't do without, You can't do risk management without being able to model. But if you rely only on models for your risk management, things go badly wrong. And part of the trouble is that extreme observations in a, in a risk distribution usually come from things that are not actually built into your model. Right. And of course, what happened? Right. And, and, and I should add, by the way, that, of course, I, I, d- I did modeling myself, but uh, you know, there was just a level of, you know, they were always physicists and you know, so on. And they weren't people who came from the environment where you would understand the inputs and outputs of the model. That was uh, and they, they were their answer was always you don't really need that anymore. So uh, I don't know if that resonates with you, but that was my experience. And I picked up a quote from Larry Summers, who said, uh, you know, the former Treasury Secretary, President of Harvard, etc., and a very brilliant academic economist in his day. Uh, but Larry said uh, that the world has, finance has moved on from people who were good at dealing with clients on the golf course to people who are good at solving very complicated differential equations involved in pricing derivative securities. And he was right in describing what had happened. But the truth is, I think what you learn on the 19th hole uh, at the golf course is as useful in making lending decisions and risk assessments 
as the uh, as what you get out of the differential equations. And I, I have to tell you that it took me about ten years to learn that there was any value to what you learned on the nineteenth hole. I I I had to move the other way. But uh, last question for you, John Kay. Your book and and, and uh, I hope this doesn't put you on the spot. But I noticed that your book in the UK was subtitled. Your book is Other People's Money, Masters of the Universe or Servants of the People. And here in the U.S., it's the real business of finance. It seems to me that uh, that other title is a bit more colorful. Uh, any insight as to why it was changed here in the U.S.? I don't know why it was changed here in the U.S. I wrote the, right, the title under which it appeared in the U.K. was the one I proposed to the U.K. publisher for the subtitle. And I think the U.S. publisher may have thought it was a bit close to the bone for an American audience. Well, I have to say, what did you conclude? Masters of the universe or servants of the people? Uh, uh, the people, uh, people in finance want to be masters of the universe. Those of us who work in the non-financial economy want to be the servants of the, want them to be servants of the people. And that's the battle we have to fight, and we actually have to get our politicians to fight that too. We have to get them to be on the side of the real economy rather than the financial economy. Well, perfectly well said, and that your book is a major contribution to that. I encourage people to read it. We've been speaking with British economist John Kay about his book just published in the U.S., Other People's Money, The Real Business of Finance. John Kay, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure.